So um, I think um, we can move on because now we have dealt with the first patient who was a perfect repair candidate, as we have seen. But not every patient is a good candidate for repair. And we have also other technologies now available in our hands very, with a very recent CE marking of the Sapien M3 system. Philip. Thank you. So um, it's my pleasure and honor to present a summary of the first commercial case using the newly approved transeptal mitral valve replacement Sapien M3 system. These are my disclosures. I'm going back to that one patient who was on the right side, and obviously I was thrilled to see that most arms were raised <laughs> with, um, with, a, with a desire to perform replacement in that patient. It's an elderly lady, and the, the age was already mentioned, but she was still quite active, but obviously suffered a lot from her severe ma. She was um, back and forth coming into the hospital discharge, again, decompensation. So she was clearly limited, and other than that, she, she, she had a quite good life at home, but she did not want to go back to the hospital. So there was a clear de desire, and obviously for us as treating decisions, also a clear indication to do something about the severe mitral regurgitation. The, that slide reminds us again about the specific anatomy we had to deal with in this scenario. You can see that the left ventricular function is preserved. So there's certainly an atrial component, so dilatation of the annulus to this um, functional mitral regurgitation. There's also a bit of tethering and then something which is often referred to as a pseudo prolapse. But why might it be difficult to do a repair in that scenario? First, the MR extends over the entire commissure. Secondly, in atrial functional MR, it is very difficult to predict the outcome. It can be good with tear, but we all struggle to predict it. And then we have additional pathologies. We have the pseudoprolapse and we have an indentation. And this is seen in multiple segments. And all that together makes it difficult to perform a tear. At least it is very hard to predict the outcome with a tear. So that's again the summary. We do have functional MR with a mainly atrial but also ventricular component, um, an MR jet which extends over the entire commissure, and we have additional pathologies which are seen in more than one segment. Let me per, uh, strongly uh, just interrupt. Martha, you have seen this patient as an imager. What do you think about those? Uh, Echoes. Is it a good candidate for repair from your point of view? Uh, thank you. I don't think it's a good candidate. I think it's a challenging candidate for repair. So probably we have another option, as this is the case. Uh, I think it's a good candidate for replacement. We could argue that we could repair it, but definitely it's not a good case. It's, a, I would say, a challenging case for Reaper because, as perfectly explained by Philip, it's a large regurgitant orifice. There's a lot of restriction in the motion of the posterior leaflet, uh, and therefore the result cannot be uh, well predicted, apart from that indentation, typically, of this restricted valve. So, challenge, not impossible, I would say, but challenging case for Reaper and I would say looks quite adequate for replacement um, to me. I mean, LVOT doesn't seem a problem there, but probably Philip will tell more. Besi besides MR reduction, uh, the concerns about leaflet um, destruction, leaflet tear in atrial uh, secondary MR, yeah, I don't think this is the case, to, to tell you the truth, because these look, to me, quite thick in leaflets. Sometimes we really find very thin leaflets that can be, with the traction in this very restricted and dilated annulus, can be tear. But to me, this is not the case. For me, this case could be challenging in terms of restriction and the big orifice and dizzy datations that sometimes when we uh, track the leaflets, we even increase them. But Philip. Luckily, we had the option to perform a replacement for the reasons just discussed, and we used the Sabium 3 system. So this system relies on a two-stage procedure, and it also has two components to it. One component is the docking station, which needs to be implanted first, and that docking station then allows, as a second step of the procedure, the implantation 
of the M3 Sapien valve, which um, obviously reminds you all of the um, S3, but you can see already that it's covered um, along the entire um, length and height of the valve. On the left hand side, you can see the docking station with multiple turns, which are wrapping around the cords of the mitra valve, and they are seated in the ventricular part of um, the valve. And there is a certain inward force pulling these cords together while the docking station wraps around the cords. Then the other part of the docking station is the atrial component, which prevents the docking station from falling into the ventricle. But it also has the additional feature of something which is called the PVL, the paravalvular leak guard, which prevents or avoids paravalvular leak after implantation of the valve. So that's again a summary and an explanation of the, uh, of the valve, the um, M3 Sapien valve. And as said already, it has some similarities, obviously, with the S3. But you can see that the entire stent frame is covered with that valve. As always with replacement, meticulous CT planning is required. Uh, the annual dimensions must be within certain range and then obviously a lot of care is taken to make sure that the risk of LVOT obstruction is low. And here we can see a new LVOT calculated with an area of more than 450, which is clearly no risk for LVOT obstruction in that case. It is obviously as a procedure very much based on echo, but also, and that is slightly different to what we normally do for tear in this procedure, fluoroscopy is also very helpful. We start off with an injection, contrast injection into the LV to mark the annular plane also on fluoroscopy, as you can see here. In the second step, guided both by fluoroscopy and echocardiography, the system is steered towards the medial commissure and then dives into the left ventricle at the position of the medial commissure because this is the perfect position to advance the docking station out of the sheath. The advancement of the docking station out of the sheath is then again controlled on fluoroscopy in several projections. One very much, one easily can appreciate whether the docking station is touching any anatomy. In that case, the position is slightly altered. And by that, carefully and controlled, both on echo and fluoroscopy, the entire docking station is advanced until multiple terms are achieved. We call it functional terms. At least three functional terms must wrap around the cords of the mitral valve. And if you have achieved that, then you are done with the ventricular component of the docking station. The second part is then unsheathing further the docking station to release the atrial component also of that docking station. Now, once this is done, the second part of the procedure is then using the same sheath, obviously, which is across a transeptal puncture positioned in the left atrium, using the same sheath to advance the on a balloon mounted um, S3, M3 Sapien valve, excuse me, we have to learn that now, the M3 <laughs> Sapien valve, and is then positioned into the docking station and then implanted by balloon inflation as we know it from valve to valve implantations, but also from tower implantations, obviously. What is interesting is that as a first step, the valve is implanted, and then it is advised to do an immediate post dilatation to really implant the, um, the valve firmly into the docking station. And that second infl inflation of the balloon using the same balloon of the delivery system also should help to avoid any paravalvular leak as illustrated here. You can see the second inflation with the same delivery system, just the balloon in place. And this is what it looks like then on fluoroscopy. And you can see that the main portion of the of the valve is or the there is one third is implanted into the docking station and two thirds are higher up because remember the docking station is slightly lower than the mitral valve annulus so most importantly what does it look like on echo that is uh, shown here and we were uh, absolutely delighted to see that there was no gradient that the valve was uh, perfectly stable in position and then obviously what we wanted to do is to treat MR and we see no residual MR and also 
nothing which is of relevance in terms of paravalvular leak. If you look very closely, then you can see that the left ventricular function looks slightly um, lower than it was at the beginning, but this recovered extremely quickly. And a couple of days after the procedure, LV left ventricular ejection fraction was already higher than the patient started off with, was a discharge at 40% with no relevant gradient and also no paravalvular leak, and the patient was happy, was doing much better, was discharged four days after the procedure, and we expect her to come back in next week, and I'm very curious to see how she's doing. So, in conclusion, you've seen an anatomy which is unfavorable for tear. It is very hard to predict the outcome of repair in such an anatomy. But now we do have replacement. It can be performed if the anatomical requirements are met very safely, also in a reasonable amount of time, also given that this is still early days, with a total abolishment of MR, good pres preservation of LV function, no gradient, and also acute clinical improvement in this case. Thank you.